So this talk has its genesis back in my PhD thesis at Manchester in 1982 on the stratigraphy and architecture of the early Transcaucasian at Yannick Tepe, that was supervised by Charles Burney. <clears throat> and in 2013, so some years ago now, I managed to publish a volume on the stratigraphy and architecture with Peter's Press, and imminent now is a second volume on the pottery, the objects, and chapters on the animal bones and the chronology by Remy Burton. So I'm going to, this evening to give you an overview of the early Transcaucasian at uh, Yannick. I'm not going to talk about the chronology except in very broad terms, because on the 2nd and 3rd of December, as some of you know, there is a, an online two-day conference on the chronology of the end of the Kura Araxes in the Southern Caucasus. So I'm saving my detailed comments on chronology for that. I'd like to thank Zara, of course, for inviting me and indeed for running this whole wonderful series. To thank the late Tony Sagona, who did so much to encourage me to go back to the old thesis and turn it into publications. Ruben Badalian, Mitchell, Stephen Buttock, and of course, Charles Burney himself and also the staff at the Manchester Museum and elsewhere in the UK, who were so helpful and accommodating when we went to uh, study and photograph and record the material which is in Britain. So here's an overview of the, of the talk, a, a background to the excavations, an overview of the early Transcaucasian periodization, uh, a brief description of the round buildings, and a few more words to say about the massive structure which Charles Burney thought were town defences. And then the ETC, there's a mistype there, the ETC rectilinear building phase. And then an overview of the pottery and some of the selected objects before going on to discuss some of the problems and uh, some suggestions for future research. This map, which will be well known to all of you of uh, uh, Stephen's map of the distribution of the Kura or the early Transcaucasian, uh, of course, in the Southern Caucasus between the Caspian and the Black Sea, uh, particularly the, the, the Kura and the Araxes Valley system from which the term Kura Araxes comes, and its extensions right down through Western Iran, down through the Zagros, and the parallel extension down the, uh, the, the Levantine, Levantine coast, right me? down into. And a closer map that shows down here where my cursor is, the position of Yannick Tepe, uh, northeast side of Lake Ermia, a little bit to the <coughs> um, west-southwest of modern Tabriz. The Araxes Valley up here taking a great big dip. So Yannick is due south of just about the southernmost uh, point in the curve of the Araxes Valley. And a closer view here, which shows Yannick Tepe and Mount Sahand. And as far as I'm able to make out, most of the water which irrigates or uh, waters this uh, fertile valley here comes from Mount Sahand, and you can see the uh, water courses. And a Google view from a few years ago, it must be pretty much the same today, which gives you an idea today of the intensity of the uh, cultivation in the area around Yannick Tepe. The mound is uh, just here now on the edge of the village. It's become surrounded by village houses. It was right on the edge of the village when Charles Burney was working there. And a little bit of the background to Charles Burney's excavations. Here's Charles Burney in the middle and his wife, Bridget Ian Todd. Charles, like Jimmy Mallard and others, started their Near Eastern careers in Egypt and with the Suez crisis moved from Egypt to Anatolia to the British Institute at Ankara, where Charles famously set off on his bicycle to do a survey of Eastern Anatolia, looking originally for, or principally for the second millennium, which he didn't find, or didn't find very much of. And of course, what he did find were the Iraqian fortresses, which he went on to survey and to publish and put those 
on the map of at least of Western scholarship. And at the same time, in the late 1950s, he made a few forays across the border into northwestern Iran, where, amongst other things, he identified the site of Yannick Tepe. In 1960, he was appointed to a lectureship in what was then the Department of Near Eastern Studies at Manchester University. Now, it was an interesting appointment because, of course, Theodore Burton Brown was in charge of the collection of Near Eastern Antiquities in the Manchester Museum, which is a, a museum that is attached to the University of Manchester. Burton Brown, of course, had excavated at Giotepe and Barlican and Karatepe. Those last two sites he, he published in, in privately funded publications on his own. There's quite a lot of material from those excavations in the UK, and I think they would repay further study and revisiting. But anyway, Charles was appointed to uh, the University of Manchester, and in 1960, he began the first of three seasons of excavations at Yannick Tepe. His total budget for the three seasons was £3,300. That's $4,500 US dollars, or about $1,500 US dollars per season. Today, hardly more than a single airfare. The excavation team was small and largely inexperienced. It was constantly overstretched. The site recording, the principal records comprised of plans at each level, which were drawn on the site with a plane table by Gordon Lawson, who of course had worked earlier with Charles on the Aratian fortresses. The sections were drawn on A4 sheets of graph paper at a scale of one to 50. My eight versions of these sections, I'll show you a couple in a moment, I think give a, a, a false impression. They give the impression that a great deal of uh, detail was recorded in the, in the original drawings, but that's not true. If you compare the, the drawings with the photographs, for instance, only the, the very broad stratigraphic breaks and outlines are showed on the, the section drawings. There was a great deal of detail that was never recorded. There was a register of objects, and almost all diagnostic shirts and finds were drawn with a greater or less registered objects were photographed. But those photographs, I'm afraid, are lost. Descriptions were very succinct, and there were no detailed trench notes at all. Almost all of the records that there were were lost when the Department of Archaeology at Manchester some years ago moved buildings. And they uh, the filing cabinet and the box of things at the end of the corridor were thrown into a skip. Fortunately, the photographs of the excavation and the object, object registers were with Charles and they have survived. Otherwise, the published drawings, the drawings that I have published and will be publishing, are inked versions that I made myself from the pencil drawings back in the 1980s, and it hasn't been able publication by photographs of sherds and objects in the museums in the UK, but more than half the registered objects are in Tehran, where they await further study. Well, here I give you a, a very brief breakdown of Imperial or the Imperial occupation as we know them at Yantepi, a small area of the Lake Neolithic, only excavated in this one square end down at the bottom of the slide, some middle Calcolithic, and then a hiatus, quite a long hiatus between the first early Transcaucasian uh, settlement. And you see here that early Transcaucasian II, which is the roundhouse phase, is divided into A and B on the basis of pottery. I'll show you the evidence for that in a moment. And then presumably a short hiatus before the early Transcaucasian three, that is the agglutinative rectilinear architecture. There's then a long hiatus until uh, the late Achaemenid period on the main mound, where there is some late Bronze Age and early and middle Iron Age in the vicinity. There's no second millennium, and a Sasanian uh, structure, a massive, small but massive Sasanian structure on the top, uh, which will appear in the next issue of the 
of ANES, the uh, Ancient Near Eastern Studies Journal that comes out of Melbourne. And here a breakdown of the early Transcaucasian at Yannick Tepe itself. The dates are very approximate. And as I said earlier, I shall say more about these in the chronology, chronology conference at the beginning of next month. The first two periods on the left column, 2A and 2B, with round freestanding huts, but patterned pottery in A, that's in levels 24 to 13, and plain pottery in the 2B, uh, three levels, 12 to 11, two levels, three levels. Uh, the division between the levels of the pattern and the plain pottery seems to be very abrupt. It seems that the change was very sudden. The dates are very approximate. There's then presumably some sort of hiatus, some sort of strat stratigraphic break between ETC3. I'll show you some evidence for uh, that, such as we have it, which is the period of the rectilinear building with plain pottery. I've put here that the uh, start for the date at Yannick uh, at the end of the fourth millennium. In my view, uh, the expansion of the early Transcaucasian into the Ermia Basin follows the late Uruk collapse, which would put it at about 3,100. But there is no certainty of that, and the evidence is really very, very thin. The end of of ETC2A on based on some new carbon dates, which Remy Burton has managed to produce for us through the Natural History Museum in Paris, would put that perhaps at around 2,800, and an end of the round buildings and ETC2 at about 2,600. Even more difficult is the chronology of ETC3. I've put there to 550, but that's a complete guess. And I'm arguing that the end of the ETC3 was about 2,200. Uh, interestingly, uh, Charles Burney himself accepted a date of about 2,200 for the end of ETC3 at the other site he excavated in the Ermia Basin, Hastavan Tepe, based on some archaeomagnetic dates that were done in the early 1980s. I would argue here that uh, the absolute dates are actually of much, much less interest than what we see, which is a very, very long span, not much less than perhaps more than a millennium of the same culture on the same site. And I think that is the real importance of Yannick Tepe. I'll say a few words about the excavation strategy and methods because they, uh, help us, I think, in, in understanding what I'm going to show you. So on the map on the left, you see the purple levels, the earliest early Transcaucasian levels, demonstrate quite clearly, as Charles was able to understand from his surface survey of the site, that the early Transcaucasian settlement was uh, or began, the, the beginnings of it were at the foot or on the lower slopes of the earlier Calcolithic mound. And only in the second set of ETC2A levels does it move higher up on the slopes, as you see in yellow, uh, presumably all the way up to the, the summit, although those levels weren't reached in the linking trench. ETC2B with the end of the uh, pattern of decorated pottery was restricted to the upper levels and the ETC3 right on the, the highest slopes of the mound. So there's a clear shift in the settlement from the lower slopes to the upper slopes. And one of the points I want to make here is that this shift in the settlement enabled Charles Burney to draw a set of linked sections which went all the way from the top to the bottom so that the stratigraphic sequence is clear even if it lacks a lot of the details that today we might have expected. It also enabled him to expose relatively large areas of uh, 2A and 2B here on the middle slopes and also on the higher part of the mound. 
And this is one of the sections I was talking about. This is in one of the uh, uh, trenches on the middle slopes. And you can see at the bottom, this little tiny sounding is the only place in the excavations where the earliest early Transcaucasian levels were found directly on top of the Calcolithic. And these levels down here, 12 and 11, had a great mixture of Calcolithic and early Transcaucasian pottery, which just tells you that, that they, whatever is going on, it's a, it's a great mixture. There's, there's nothing in situ. And then you have these earliest excavated round houses. I'd also like to show you the, for instance, these three walls here, which are labeled 35 circle or hut 35, which demonstrate very clearly how these huts were rebuilt time and time again on exactly the same place, or more or less exactly the same place, and the internal floors uh, were laid and raised, and presumably the walls and the roofs were raised at the same time. And these broad levels uh, here the, uh, in the trenches, but it's these sorts of broad levels which we've been able to extend right across the mound to give us the basic stratigraphic sequence. Another feature of Yannick Tepe is that there were no pits. Uh, this funny thing here, whatever it is, I think it's just clipped by the trench. It's the only pit that, uh, or intrusion, which comes down anywhere into these ETC2 levels. So however much we might regret that we don't have more detail, the broad stratigraphic sequence, I think, is very clear. During the excavation, there was no record or no mention made of any of these huts being dug into the earlier levels. They were all said to have been founded uh, on the <coughs> straight on the ground surface at the time, and then the floors were raised inside as the detritus in the open areas outside uh, went up and up. But it's quite clear, as you'll see in a moment, uh, that the huts were all entered not at ground level, but from higher up through raised doorways. So one thing to check if anyone was to go back to Yannick or indeed to work on a similar site is whether these are actually slightly subterranean and they've been slightly dug in. If that does turn out to be the case, there need, need to be some modification to the stratigraphy, but nothing that will affect the main development that I'm going to be talking about. And here a section up on the center of the site where you have at the bottom, these levels here, if you can see my cursor, of the round houses, and then this line here following it with my cursor, which is the break with the rectilinear buildings, like the huts rebuilt time and time again on more or less the same line, but on a larger scale. So the only evidence for the transition from two to three is this line here. And I assume there's some sort of hiatus and some sort of leveling. I don't think that, that, that there's a sudden change. Uh, we have no idea really what the length of that hiatus was, except that the pottery, as I will show you, doesn't suggest it lasted for very long at all. Of course, it's possible that if you were to excavate on a different part of the mound, you might find some of the and you might find levels where there is more of a transition than we have in the excavated areas. But it seems to me we can only work with what we've got. So I'd like to give you now a, a brief description of the main features of these circular huts. Here they are in the, the long trench M where the figures are working down on the bottom there. This is the, the Neolithic sounding. Uh, here are some of the earlier of the huts, and you can see there mud brick walls, they seem to be slightly in curving. And you can see in the nearest one, some of these internal built kit kitchen fittings and so forth and so on. And you can also see the highly layered, more or less level stratigraphy. It also struck me when I was putting this together that uh, when you look at these sections, any idea that you might be able to re reveal more of the settlement plan simply by surface scraping isn't going to be very productive. There's too much wash off the higher parts of the mound to burying the, the tops of these huts, I think, for surface scraping to be successful. 
And here are a 3D on one side and a plan on the other. And you can see in the 3D the idea that the individual, uh, that the internal spaces of the huts were divided by these low partitions. There are benches. And then there are these ranges of, of uh, kitchen installations with bins, ovens, halves, gypsum plaster trays like this one, probably for rolling out flat bread. The doorway you can see is quite high. And outside, not annexes or porches, but bins, they were all empty. None of the bins were found to contain anything when they were excavated, but presumably they were covered. And to get into the door here, you'd be climbing over, covering or filling of these bins and then climbing down into the huts. And you see a plan on the right, which shows uh, how closely packed together these huts were with outside areas called courtyards, but external areas uh, with bins very often in front of the, the doorway, but also as in the, the illustration on the left, uh, a, a great plethora of, of bins in the external areas. And uh, a reconstruction, uh, the, the, the same one showing the door high up in the walls, partly in the mud brick wall and partly in the presumably wattle and daub superstructure. There were some uh, pieces of wattle and daub, but not very much found in one or two of the huts which had undergone fire. The way these buildings are pushed so closely together must show that, that the roofing was domed and they're not overhanging eaves of thatch, as has sometimes been suggested. So that they seem to be domed coverings of clay on uh, wattle superstructures. And on the right, one of the two silos, or presumably silos that were excavated with concentric walls, which seem to show subsequent uh, set of phases of uh, more or less continual enlargement. And there is a photograph of uh, that same silo, giving you an idea of the way it was found and indeed of the way it was excavated. If you've got a good screen, you might see here that the top of this wall has been cut through and continues up in section. And you can see the stratigraphy inside going up to the later wall and over some of the earlier walls. Presumably, this is all in use at the same time, but I say presumably. It's interesting because these uh, represent a particular type of storage, presumably for grain, but again, nothing was found inside them. Now, this is the largest exposure of the ETC2A levels. It's a, a, a version of the well-known published plan, and I will point out the salient features. This huge stone and mud brick massive building here with a little narrow passage running through it. You see only, it's a scale there, only a metre wide, which Charles thought was a town wall, but it doesn't make any sense as a wall. It doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And it doesn't, whatever you do, seem to be going round a town or round even part of the settlement. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, the larger of the two silos, again, with concentric walls and a whole set of phases of building and rebuilding, apparently getting larger as it went through its various stages. And then the crowding of these round circular huts, those with internal uh, built kitchens, I have termed houses, and the ones without, like 12, 17 here don't seem to have any sort of internal visions, but they're no smaller than the other huts. They must have had uh, different functions. I don't think it's that they, the built-in kitchens didn't survive. I think they simply didn't have internal features. And although there is a standardization in that every time you come through a doorway, the kitchen fittings are always immediately on your right, there is no standardization at all as to the direction in which the door faces. So this one, for instance, faces to the northwest, this one faces north, this one faces southeast, and so on. So the position of the entrance uh, seems to be dictated by 
uh, the use and availability of external space rather than by any other factors. And you see here this courtyard. And here was an interpretation I made for the publication of the first monograph, where I attempted to, to reconstruct the defensive walls in the only way it could, only direction it could possibly have gone. And also to show you how you have this enclosed courtyard with no entrances apparently into any of the surrounding huts from this courtyard. I think there's a, a major issue which I will come back to perhaps at the end of the lecture, if we have time, about how we are to understand these buildings in uh, terms of social structure of the settlement. Are these, is it right to call these ones houses and these not call these houses? What does a house represent? And what is the relationship between houses and households? However, we are to interpret or think of the idea of a household. So how are the people in these different buildings related to one another socially in kin groups? What is the structure? How many of these buildings or these other buildings is this silo uh, representing or serving? And there is a view uh, as, the, as it was at the end of the excavation, when the excavation was halted. That is what Gordon Lawson drew on the plan with his plane table. And there's obviously a lot more subtlety and subphasing and so on to the stratigraphy than was ever recorded, which doesn't help in trying to interpret it. And here just to give you a view of one of the internal uh, fitted kitchens with a set of storage bins with some sort of oven with heated stones, a fire pit down here, and a gypsum plaster tray here, perhaps for rolling out bread and so forth and so on. So these are very elaborate standard, more or less standard things. They're more or less the same in each of the huts, but not identical. And here the so-called so defences. Uh, you can see that most of it is built of these large rounded river boulders. Uh, they're pretty big, some of these stones. And some of it is also built of these large square mud bricks. Charles Burney thought that the nearest source of the river boulders for the building was at least 10 kilometers away. So we are talking about probably hundreds of cartloads, and presumably ox-drawn carts, bringing these boulders from a riverbed somewhere to Yannick Tepe and being used to make this construction. And also communal labor, presumably to build these, to make these large square bricks and to make the building. I'm now very tempted to see this as having absolutely nothing at all to do with, the, with defenses and being some sort of internal platform or feature perhaps towards the center of the site. And of course, some of you will know that there are not very dissimilar feature has, was found by Tony Sagona at Sosshood, but I'm not this evening going to draw specific parallels. I think the idea that this was a defensive wall uh, simply does not hold up, and I don't really think it ever held up. So we must think of these as being platforms, big internal features, but they do demonstrate a level of communal activity and organization. To say something about roundhouse continuity, I show two here, uh, one on the left with uh, the three phases of the silo and then the silo being rebuilt in almost exactly the same place and the same sort of size, but now used in three consecutive phases as uh, a house or a, a hut with kitchen fittings. And you can see how they, uh, the whole thing is rebuilt more or less <coughs> the same size and the same place. And they, kitchens more or less replicating each other, but there are changes from one level to another. And just another example of the same thing from a different part of the site to show how uh, the same part is rebuilt time and time again. My own view is that this rebuilding was very largely for practical reasons. <coughs> 
to do with the availability of space when a, a hut needed to rebuilt, be rebuilt. There wasn't much choice but to build on top of the, of the old one. There were presumably advantages in using the stubs of the earlier wall as a foundation for the later wall. Whether there should be other kinds of uh, explanation, such as has been offered for Neolithic sites, particularly Chattelhook and Ashokle, where you get the same sort of rebuilding, Ian Hodder has called history houses. Uh, I don't want to say anything about Chattel, but I don't think here that there is any evidence for purposeful closure of the houses. There's no clear evidence for ritual activity associated with rebuilding or filling of the houses or anything like that. I perfect, com completely accept that absence of that type of evidence is not a very strong argument, but I don't see any evidence for any sort of ritual activity associated with the rebuilding or with uh, the closing of the houses. So let's move on whether or not we have a hiatus to this rectilinear agglutinative building. Uh, some of these, if the thickness of the walls anyway is, is evident, some of them would presumably have had an upper story. And the main difference is that they had flat roofs uh, with timber beams and mud, central mud brick piers, an entrance from the roof, either by ladders or perhaps this block here uh, was possibly tentatively identified as being a mud brick staircase leading down from the roof. You have the same, as in here, exactly the same sort of built kitchen ranges as you have in the round houses. And here, uh, one of the rare colour photographs which has survived, showing uh, the way it was with the excavation. You can see clearly the mud bricks. You can see the successive phases of wall. You can see the way that different rooms are built back to back, presumably to carry the roofing. A uh, view of one of these paths with a plaster tray here, which has been burnt, and uh, ovens and fire pits, quern stones, part of uh, apparently a central pier, benches around the walls, and so forth and so on. And another a close-up view of one of these kitchen features, and here a view with the central pier and bins and benches of Bridget Burney standing. Uh, in the middle of a square room. The immediate impression you get from looking at these different pictures is that ETC2 and ETC3 were very different. But as this table shows, that might not in fact be the case. Clearly the shape was different, circular rather than square or rectangular. And the circular huts were always single story whereas at least some of the rectangular buildings had upper floors. But otherwise, perhaps they're not quite so different. The floor areas seem to be very much the same. The rooms, remember, are square. Now, we tend to think in the Middle East in general of room spans not being more than three metres, at least in ordinary vernacular architecture, because that is thought to be the sort of span for a poplar or a willow beam, something like that. But because these rectilinear buildings in the later early Transcaucasian had these big central mud brick piers, the beam ends could rest on the mud brick piers so that square rather than rectangular rooms could be uh, easily roofed. You went down in both cases, steps down into the round houses and stairs or ladders down into the rectilinear buildings. The same built ranges in the kitchens, storage in bins in open areas with the round houses was presumably moved up onto the roofs in the square houses. But circulation clambering over these bins between round houses was surely no uh, easier than uh, crawling around over roofs and going up and down ladders or staircases. In neither case is there any evidence for animals, I think, in, in the roundhouses, as well as in the rectilinear building, the animals were kept off site. 
There were, of course, advantages to the rectilinear building, reduced fire risk being the biggest, but also better thermal properties, keeping it cooler in winter and warmer in summer, and perhaps drier storage and activity spaces up on the roofs than down nearer the ground in the, the yards and the open spaces between the round houses. But the rectilinear building did require the acquisition of more timber and perhaps more intensive uh, labour for building. So that brings to an end my very brief overview of summary of the architectural differences at Yannick. I'll now say something about the ceramics. I'm not going to show you very much, but I'm going to try and show you some of the, some of the, the main features. Here in the earliest levels, 19 and 18, you can see that we have all the full range of, almost the full range of shapes and of decorative motifs that we see right through the ETC2A, uh, including animals, these spirals, which I think represent mouflon, uh, geometric bands and panels, uh, birds, uh, individual geometric motifs, and so on. There is no red and black. So I know an enormous amount has been written about red and black. Uh, Kuraraxis were in Anatolia and the Caucasus, but at Yannick Tepe, we don't have any of this red and black wear. So whatever was happening to the west and the north is not happening down here in the Ermia Basin. I think that most of the vessels were intended to be black, although a great deal of it is bottled or reddish. Some of it is a result of secondary burning. They were handmade. When they had dried to a leather hard stage, they were burnished and they were decorated with impressed patterning. Slip is very rare and after firing, the patterning is almost always filled with a white paste. We know this is after firing because where shirts are burnt, they, the white paste readily uh, burns and falls out. Most of the white paste is fugitive. So I say I, most of it was white filled. I think it was probably all white filled or intended to be white filled so that you had a very stark, stark contrast between the shiny black burnish surface and the white fill. But in many cases, they're firing technology was not good enough for them to accurately achieve the sort of black surfaces that they wanted. The majority of patterning is geometric, bands and panels, and other motifs are restricted to a very small repertoire of wild animals, water birds, ibex, and mouflon, and possibly to representations of leopards or panthers. There are no depictions of human beings. There are no depictions of domestic animals, nor of wild pig or rock or equids. So it's not only what animals are represented on the pots, this lovely little one here just under the, the handle, uh, it's also what was not representative on the pots tells us as much as anything else, and nothing at all that in any way resembles the sorts of uh, depictions on pottery and other objects that Paul Collins was talking to us about just a few weeks ago. In ETC2A, I think that almost all the pottery was patterned, apart from the cooking pots, a few of these big lids, and a small number, of course, very utilitarian. Uh, vessels. And in ETC 2B, the patterning just stops. The shapes are different. The method of manufacture is the same. They're clearly early Transcaucasian shapes, but the shapes are different. The handles become much more prominent, much larger. Uh, a lot of the tall neck jars go, and you get these smaller, rather different vessels. The introduction of some numbers of trays, which may, I say, may represent uh, a difference in the way in which bread was baked or something like that. But there is a very clear difference between the pottery in these two roundhouse phases. 
I've said before, but it's worth repeating again here, that had the periodization been done on the pottery alone, it would have been rather different to the way it's, it comes out having been done on the uh, apparently sharp change and differentiation in the architecture between the two periods. Another uh, selection of ETC2, or a selection here, uh, ETC2B pottery, or ETC2-3 and B. Sorry. I wanted to point out this vessel here, which has two prominent dimples. It's one of only two such vessels, both of which come from ETC-3, that is from the final phase. There are no dimple or groove and dimple uh, vessels in ETC-2A. Uh, or in ETC 2B, uh, or three. So quite a difference between Yannick Tepe and what we have at Haftavan, the Haftavan pottery that I published a few years ago in Paleo Orient, where we have groove and dimple clearly in uh, an earlier period. So I think there is a, a strong regional uh, difference there, as well as the regional differences in the uh, obvious re regional differences in the incised pottery. I wrote an article for Paleo Orient a few years ago in which I mistakenly said there was no metal at Yannick and I had overlooked this one copper blade here which Charles Burney had already published in one of the interim reports. In preparing all of the finds for publication, it's been possible to recognize other objects associated with metalworking. There's large pottery lab ladle, two pottery to airs, one of which Charles Burney published as a phallus, a number of simple open molds, and one mold, these are two views of the same piece, uh, part of a two piece mold for a small shaft hole axe. That plus one or two other fragments of these molds is the total assemblage of metalworking evidence and metal uh, from a whole millennium of early Transcaucasian occupation at Yannick Tepe. So while I was wrong to say there was none at all, I see nothing to change my opinion that metalworking was of very minor importance. Evidence for non-local objects is very meagre. On the left, flint and chert, sickle blades and segments, similar to those found on many other early Transcaucasian sites in the Southern Caucasus. There is no obsidian, although obsidian was found in Neolithic and Calcolithic levels. These sickle elements perhaps represent the only evidence for finished items that might have been acquired by trade or exchange. And I say that just because they are well known uh, from a large number of early Transcaucasian sites in the Southern Caucasus. It looks as though they were centrally produced and there's no evidence at all that they were manufactured at Yannick itself. Also non-local on the right, the ground stone, quern stones and rubbers, and also these uh, rather nice stone pestles, all made from igneous stone, presumably collected from a riverbed somewhere. There's no evidence that these were traded items. And indeed, they, uh, the shapes and the sizes of the pestles are not very standard. It doesn't really suggest a, a, a centralized or an industrial production. It's rather as though uh, people were making their own. So that sums up more or less the, uh, <clears throat> the evidence for the material culture. So let me turn now to finish with some of the uh, conclusions and then go on to look at some of the questions and the problems. I don't think anything here is particularly new, but it seems to be clear that as Charles Burney said many years ago now, the people who had this early Transcaucasian or Kura Axis material culture, including their building and their settlement plans and whatever, 
arrived at Yannick Tepe, arrived in the Ermia Basin with this material culture already fully developed. And this surely means that there was some kind of migration into the eastern Ermia Basin, and indeed at Haftavan into the western Ermia Basin from elsewhere. And I agree with Charles Burney that it makes a great deal of sense to define the start of early Transcaucasian to in the Ermia Basin, or at least in the northeastern corner of the, Ur Ur of the Ermia Basin, with the start of the ETC2 in this region. We are dealing at Yannick with a permanently settled village practicing mixed agriculture. There is no evidence for aggression. There are no weapons. There are no projectile points at all. No evidence of destruction other than the odd accidental fire. And as I've shown you, no evidence, I think, for defenses. No, no evidence at all that the people who lived in this village found or saw any need to build defensive walls around their settlement. There was a clear level of communal activity as demonstrated by the silos and by the public building or the platforms or however we are to term this massive structure of stone and big square mud bricks. Otherwise, there is very little evidence indeed for trade, acquisition of raw materials or indeed of finished uh, objects from outside. The ceramic change comes at the boundary between early Transcaucasian 2A and B, and the building change comes at the boundary between ETC 2B and ETC 3, presumably followed by a slight hiatus. And at the end of ETC 3, the site seems to have been peacefully abandoned. There's no evidence at all of destruction. It seems as though the people who were there packed up and left. So reasons to go back to Yann Yannick Tepe. Well, there are many reasons to go back to Yannick Tepe, but I put a few up here, which I think are perhaps burning uh, issues in the hope that some uh, bright, young, enthusiastic Iranian archaeologists will go back to Yannick Tepe and try and resolve some of these questions. The first, of course, is absolute chronology. That is the acquisition of a set of samples for a really good sequence of carbon-14 dates. To uncover more of the settlement plan, to try and understand what the spatial relationships are between these different types of roundhouses, those with kitchens and those without, uh, the walls and the bins between them, to see if a larger exposure of the settlement plan would give us clues into how to understand my third question there, which is social structure. What do we mean by houses? What might we mean by households? Is there any way that the archeology span can tell us something about how the uh, village society worked, whether it's really as egalitarian as the evidence to hand would suggest? There are certainly questions about the agricultural economy, the role of stock breeding, the possibility of irrigation agriculture. Charles Burney said that when he was there in the 60s, all the crops were irrigated. But I think that might be a reflection of the fact that the state had provided copious irrigation water in new systems of concrete canals and pumps and so on. And of course, whether there was any role at all for uh, seasonal transhuman taking of uh, flocks and herds up onto Mount Sahan or elsewhere. Ceremonial structures, in other words, what really is this massive, great, big uh, stone and, and mud brick building? It would be very helpful to excavate more of it to try and see uh, what its form is and whether there is anything else associated with it. And extra settlement activities, where are the workshops? Where was the pottery being made? Even if it's, even if metalworking is very small, somewhere there's some sort of metalworking going on. So 
to look on the fringes of the settlement to try and look at all of those things that were not uh, going on in the buildings which have been excavated towards the settlement core. And then some broader outstanding problems, which I hope that Mitchell is going to answer next week when he gives a, a more wide ranging talk about the Kura Araxes. Where did these people from Yannick Tepe come from? Both the, the sets of internal kitchen fittings and the decorated pottery uh, are without direct parallel anywhere else. There is nothing so far that anybody has found to the north uh, in the Araxes Valley, there's nothing to the northwest and there's nothing to the northeast. So where did these people come from? I don't think they arrived at Yannick and suddenly started making this highly decorated pottery just like that. They brought these traditions with them, but we don't know where they came from. The whole question of absolute chronology, of how are we to fit these changes at Yannick Tepe into a broader picture? Is this periodization of roundhouses to a uh, rectangular building or rectilinear building that we see at, at Yannick Tepe. We know we have the same sort of uh, change at Haftavan Tepe on the western side of the lake, although the pottery is very different. Uh, but is that, uh, are these changes happening at the same time or are there large differences and each of these sites has its own historical trajectory with same sorts of changes happening, but not necessarily at the same time for the same reason. And that brings us to the much more difficult question of larger questions of periodization and terminology. Uh, Kura Raxis, early Transcaucasian, should we try and come up with some new set of terms? Should we restrict early Transcaucasian, say, to, uh, uh, to Iran and not extend it up into the Caucasus? These are very difficult questions. I don't see a simple straightforward answer, but they are questions which need to be addressed. And then the problem of re regionalization. It's clear if you look at the Ermia Basin that on the eastern side we have at Yannick Tepe and at Godin Tepe right down in the south, and possibly from a little bit of uh, survey work, a site or two in between, where the tradition of incising and white filling black burnished pottery uh, is, is prominent, if not dominant. But the motifs on the Godin Tepe pottery are quite different to those at, at Yannick Tepe. And on the western side at Haftavan and Gyo Tepe, Gilja, right down to the few sheds from Hassan Lu, uh, incised and patterned pottery is very rare, almost non existent. So there clearly is regionalization but we don't at the moment know enough other than to divide the Ermia Basin between East and West. And my final question, since this whole series uh, which Zaha has, has so kindly put together is about urbanization in Iran, why was it that none of the early Transcaucasian settlements became urban? And I will finish there.